I'm very lucky to be back for another conversation with Dr. Colin Birch, an obstetrician and gynecologist from Calgary. If you haven't heard it, don't miss the longer podcast by Dr. Birch where he talks about his practice, his experiences as both a defendant and an expert witness in the medical legal world, um, his ideas for perhaps how malpractice could be changed or improved, some of the cases and the stories he's worked on his experience. It's a great podcast. But as I often do on this Inside Medical Malpractice podcast, I really like to find out not just about the stories that people have to tell in their experience as professionals, but who we're talking to and who they are as a person. So I've prepared some questions for Dr. Birch, which we're gonna talk about now. He's a great talker. He's got a lovely accent. He's lovely to listen to. So welcome back, Dr. Birch. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank you. So glad you're here with us again. So we talked a lot in the other podcast about your work, but let's talk about you, the guy, Colin Birch. You're very, very busy. Um, as anybody who listened to the intro on the other podcast will find out, you're very, very busy. And you, on top of your clinical practice, you do some medical legal work as well. What do you do when you're not busy working? Sleeping. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. I... I I have several passions outside of medicine, which have always taken a back to time. And I've always, sports has always been a huge part of my life. And I think it's been like for many people who are in medicine or in any, any um, high pressure job. I mean, it's a, it's a way of, um, uh, it's a way of relief. I mean, sports has always been big for me. I, mean, I played competitive rugby and football as in soccer. Um, when I was younger and obviously my bones don't allow me to do that now. So I bike a lot and I do, I road bike long distances for the most part. In the winter I used to ski. Uh, I don't ski as much, a bit of cross country skiing now. I used to run, can't run quite as far anymore. Um, so it, sports has been a big thing. And the other thing is the arts. I've always, I think it's interesting. I started collecting art when I lived with twin fine arts students as, as a medical student and when they moved on and one of them actually is a, a curator of a, an art gallery actually in central london now um they gave me some of their their paintings which were unusual and abstract but i found fascinating and they were lovely and uh, and so i've i've been collecting basically arts since then and the other obviously passion is music um and uh, I was involved in music when I was younger um, and now I just I will go to whatever concert of whatever genre of music whatever type of music so I have all kinds of interests outside of medicine and I have a bit of a business outside of medicine as well which has got nothing to do with medicine which is keeps me um, keeps my mind occupied it's more of a sort of a IT kind of aspect towards uh, medicine mm. Well, that sounds great and really interesting. Do you play any instruments? I play guitar badly, and as a youngster, I sang for a punk rock group, um, probably badly, because it was required that you sang badly in when in in the era when punk rock was really punk rock, not the sort of stuff now. But um, but that was an interesting, um, very um, it's a very dynamic time at those and i'm talking the mid 70s now which dates me um it was a very dynamic time in music uh with punk rock and the change of the punk rock and the like um but yeah so yeah yeah it's a more more than natural music of voice which I, unfortunately again has deteriorated over time uh, <laughs> so i don't even do that much anymore I can only imagine that a punk rock band in your world in the 70s was just about the best thing ever, the perfect thing to do at that time in your uh, life. Had, uh, you know, it's everything that, everything that uh, you don't think of a, of, a, of a physician, an earring, white blonde, dash blonde hair. I mean, it was, looking back on it, it was an embarrassment. Thankfully, there was no social media at that point in time so <laughs> pictures of that are very few and far between thank goodness um, you, say thank, you say thankfully but i'm kind of sorry that that isn't mm, kicking around out there i, I'd love, I'd love to I did that. actually search to see if anything was on the internet you know people because I, I i've moved so many times in my life that you know those 
pictures got lost. And actually now looking back and it, it would actually be quite interesting to look back at it and see because the, some of the guys I played with actually went on to became become musicians for, for life, as it were. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's interesting. And yeah, it's, uh, you can have a passion for life, right? I mean, I mean, I have a passion for medicine. I always have had a passion for medicine ever since I got hooked when I was, went to medical school. It was interesting. The reason I, 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 I got caught leaving medical school about six months after I started as I was leaving the back door to go to the students union because they had several bars there. And this guy stopped me and said, um, where are you going? Because it was like 11 o'clock in the morning, of course. And of course, the English go at 11 o'clock to the park pubs because that's when they open. <laughs> and I said, oh, no, I'm going, I'm just going to go and study in the, in, in the, um, in the university library and walked off and this guy sort of accepted it for what it was and that was november and so every december they used to have this party in the medical school and we got introduced to the dean and that person i met going to the pub in the middle of the morning in the middle of lectures was actually the dean of medicine who there was kind of an embarrassment because he he recognized me and i really recognized him yeah oops <laughs> well, it was it was medicine those days. He just had a laugh about it. it. Was it was? I mean, I thought, oh god, the guy's going to kick me out of medical school. And the guy said, oh, yeah, I did that when I was a medical student too. And I thought, oh, fantastic, that's great. My medical school interview was was conducted in a pub. Oh my goodness! <laughs> it was Newcastle, and um, yeah, they just sort of took you down. Well, let's go and let's go and let's go and have a chat about. Um, and one of the things about um, medical school is interesting. You obviously had to get. Um, um a certain grades at school and everything else but you, you were aided to get into medical school by things such as being able to play rugby or field hockey or or football well so i mean it, it was always it's always a, a huge help you know so yeah I, I yeah but you've got to be passionate about life and do things you're passionate about you know, medicine, 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 medicine occupies so much of your life. It's, it, it can be all consuming. And right now, it actually, to be honest with you, with COVID and everything else, it is all consuming. But um, yeah. I think um, I've met a lot of doctors who are musicians and mm. lawyers who are musicians. Yeah. Yeah. My husband plays, has played in a band off and on for the last cool. few years. And it's all doctors and lawyers in yeah. this band, mm. and they're often guitar players and they're singers. So it'd be yeah. interesting to look at, you know, what in your brain, <laughs> what in yes. your brain makes you a good musician and a good doctor or a good lawyer. I think so it's, tell, it, us a, tell us a bit more about your side hustle there that you mentioned that you've got a business outside oh, of yeah. I, I've always been interested. Well, first of all, I've always been interested in property. It's always been a thing ever since I was a, a young man. Um, I've bought and sold. It's, I, I think it must be origin. I think there must be some gypsy somewhere back there because I've bought and sold things ever since I was a child, really. Um, and um, so, yeah, I, you know, I, I've been involved in projects like that. And I'm also building projects. But uh, the IT project is, it's, I, I mean, I'm not really a driving force behind it. I suppose I'm, I'm an interested investor as opposed to the driving force behind. If I'm being perfectly frank, and it's a it's a medical IT company um, and dental IT company, um, which I got involved in for 15, 20 years ago now. So I, I find it very interesting, you know. Because again, it, it's it's intellectually stimulating. I, I'm not the driving force. I make no claim for that. I'm not trying to claim that. But it's interesting looking how it's been developed because it's something that is not something that I um, it, not something that really I'm trained for um, from a business development point of view. But I've always been fascinated the way that business has developed, um, and you know, and obviously the way they develop develop the project as well. So yeah, so it's interesting. Again, it's just it's just a side interest well I, it may be a really good one i mean one thing i think it's going to be one of the covid fallouts or changes that stick is the way technology is used in healthcare Absolutely. and uh, so it's an, it's going to be an up-and-comer Absolutely. So I, I spoke with a, an internist from new york not that long ago mm. uh, it was a different person that was on the podcast right. he was a doctor he was a critical care physician and he said that's just a huge challenge right now to kind of gather that information, know where to find it, know what to trust, know what to use, the healthcare information. So. Yeah, I mean, I mean, social media is rife, if we're talking about social media, is rife with 
information and misinformation mm -hmm. and because it's not and, and, and obstetrics is the absolute top of the tree when it comes well, maybe plastics maybe i don't know obstetrics yeah. especially is, right. is top of the tree because invariably the patient population are young and very tech savvy so as a result of that they are able to really use social media the trouble is is that there's a lot out on the social media which is opinion based but is but it, it's written in a way where if you're a casual reader you would be absolutely convinced that that is actually what's happening um and uh, you know I, I trying to trying to not fight that disinformation you can't but finding a way that allows people to filter the information um maybe some way of en of engaging um the it companies in that regard i mean it's like um you know facebook or twitter i mean once it's out there it's out there it's in out there in perpetuity i mean once you've said it you've said it and um you know which has played out poorly as we've seen for certain political people recently um <laughs> that you know and so yeah it's the IT has been a challenge, there's no doubt. But I mean, I mean it's fascinating because it wasn't, the company is not really based around that. It's based around medical record, dental record, et cetera. Um, but it's always interesting the way it's been developed. And I've always been that sort of a sat on the sideline, fascinated by the development, not really contributing that much, if I'm perfectly honest. But um, uh, yeah, so it's good to have things outside. I think, I think for, I think for physicians, and I can only talk for physicians now because that's what I am. I think I think it's healthy to have something like that. Not just not just um, healthy to have um, sports and whatever else, but to have some something else that you can sort of use your your intellect, your mind into as well, which is completely different to medicine. Completely different. Um, I think it keeps your mind it keeps your mind young and alive. Actually, I mean, though I find it confusing, obviously, but um, I, I I like to learn about these things, and I think it's very good for people in medicine to do that. I think we get dragged into this idea that we have this core business, and that's all we, you know, all we should be doing. Um, and people in medicine, as a rule, I mean, I never never fail to see how bright people are that go into medicine now. I mean, there's not. A, not a chance I would get into medicine now. Not a chance. And then and, and get into residency, absolutely zero chance. And head of department, well, there's God only knows how I got to that. But still, um, you know, so it's, it, I, I'm, I just, people so in medicine, I can just talk to medicine because that's all I really know from that perspective. They're so bright and, 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 you know, they've done so much so early in their lives. I mean, I mean, I probably won't compare what i did in my early life compared to what they've done because it's probably not good for the podcast but um yeah i i i, you know, I never end to be absolutely amazed by how intellectually and how driven these people are going to medicine now um and it's admirable sometimes i think it's to their detriment however though i think that they that that um it, it medicine in a way it's it's lost a little bit that that the artist if you will um so it's very factually driven and you, i'm gonna draw the analogy is that if calgary medical school course is three years i'm sure i'll get lambasted for saying this if anybody from the university is this and it's so factually driven there's no real i don't think any time for creative thought outside of it where we were in medical school we had all kinds of creative thought outside and around medicine um and the same goes with like internships i mean i did an internship in three or four different specialties now they just go from medical school straight into a residency program so they have no clue about anything else apart from what they're in so and they but the but there's and I get it's, to my point is they get channeled so much that they just no I I very bright people admirable that they want to go into medicine because medicine is not it's not really what I went into particularly to be honest with you um you know and it's much more difficult now there is you have so many more check boxes and and the like and um 
So it's much more difficult, I think, to be successful in medicine now. So that dovetails nicely into a question I was going to ask you in just a minute. What advice would you give to these young doctors just starting out right now? Make sure you're passionate about it. Make sure you're not doing medicine because it happens that you've got a high IQ and it seems like the right thing to do. You, you've got to be passionate. And this is motherhood and apple pie again, but you've got to be passionate about helping people, not just saying it because you know, you know a beauty pageant and I want to help the world or you're in an interview. You need to be passionate about actually helping people selflessly. So not seeing helping people as a stepping stone to something else, but helping something people intrinsically because that's what you want to do. Now, people say that's also general and so, but it's actually, it's actually the basic tenets behind why you should do medicine as far as I'm concerned. You know, you don't have to be the brightest necessarily to do medicine. In fact, I think in some ways, Oftentimes, the really bright people don't make the best physicians because they overthink things. They overanalyze and overthink things. I think you have to have some modicum of intelligence. Don't get me wrong now. But I think you've got to, be, you, you've got to have that passion for doing this. Because if you don't, you can still do it. But medicine starts to become look like, like an, a, an industry. And therefore your medical practice becomes flexed around other things other than patient care. Mm. I so think that's too, that my reflects, <clears throat> any, you know, I think um, <clears throat> anybody who's been in healthcare for a very long time, there, there's ups and downs in jobs come and go oh, and they're good and bad. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah, yeah. Um, but when you meet someone who's just completely not passionate and are worn out or exhausted by their job, that comes through because the intangible aspect of emotional intelligence and caring yes. is a very, very important part and when added to the knowledge and the skill and the experience. But that, I, think, yeah, I think you're right. Um, but, but the other problem, of course, is, is, is the pressures. There are so many pressures now. I mean, because when I started, Billy, the only pressure was to get through from one year to the next and finish your medical degree and then get trained. Now there's pressures because, you know, I just talked about social media pressures. There are, there are, there are academic pressures which we never had, expectations we never had. Um, and the rate of, I don't like the word burnout particularly. I, you know, it's just used so generically these days. But I think... You know, emotional and social difficulty, I think, is a better way of terming it, it is, is rife amongst the medical and nursing profession. I mean, it's not, it's, do not get me wrong, it is not isolated to the to physicians, it's nurses as well. I mean, because of the pressures that are on them, you know, the, 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 the emotional and social toll it takes, certainly if you work in certain specialties, and certainly obstetrics would be one of those. I, I you know, I, I if I'm in a perfect world, they should have three months off a year. Yeah, right. Now, I don't mean you should go three months and just diddle around. I mean, three months to do something purposeful, but <laughs> three months off because it is such a difficult job and the emotional and social toll is so great that um, we don't make provision for that. And so docs work because they have all kinds of pressures and, and, and nurses the same and but there's no social loophole so if you do have a breakdown and you're actually you know and people do even the best people do um oftentimes there's a stigma involved in that which you know i mean mental health is a huge issue right now and i think it's been with us for a long period of time i don't I mean, it depends what you call mental health, but I, I think, the, again, back to that emotional and social, just total breakdown that people get, you can put it as mental health if you'd like to. Um, I think just we just not recognize the way it should be. And mm. the only way mm -hmm. that people can get better from that is, is literally physical and mental rest. And that doesn't mm -hmm. mean, you know, having three days off. No, that means having a substantive period of time off that's respected and is protected. 
Mm, that's really good. I bet you just made a lot of fans in the healthcare world today. I, and I agree with I'm you. I'm not trying to make fans. I just, it, it's just, it, it's, it's, just it's more and more obvious to me the more I go through this. I mean, I'm from a, a generation, you know, where we worked because we had to, because there wasn't that many of us around. Literally, yeah. we, we did it because no one else was going to do the job. There was, mm -hmm. now we have a, actually quite a lot of people doing the job. Mm -hmm. um, so we are in that place. And, and I think younger practitioners definitely have have, it, have a better handle than we do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that lifestyle and like. The problem with that is it's flipped, I think, too far the other way where medicine started to be looked at by some of the younger generations a nine to five job and it is not a nine to five job. Mm -hmm. So yes, I admire their idea about work-life balance, but that balance can't be predetermined like it may be if you work in a bank or a law office, which we talked about law today, where they can oftentimes predetermine their hours. We can't predetermine our hours. We can say we're go we have got scheduled for this, but invariably the day is this, which is unscheduled. Um, so, I, you know, I, I think we need to look better at it. And I think as when we look at patient safety, I think that has to be one of the components of it as well. You know, we always look at, again, adding even more on people's shoulders to learn and do without realizing the toll that can take on, on, on people who work. It, it, just, it doesn't recognize. And, you know, I still work really hard. And, I, you know, people say to me, why do I really work hard? And unfortunately, um, it's because I just, I think it, I'm, I, I'm a bit like the guinea pig on the wheel. You know, I've been doing it so long now that it's, it's it, I don't know how I'm going to jump off. I'm, I will, obviously, and I'm starting to. I'm starting to slow down a bit. But me slowing down apparently is all these new people working doubly hard. So, you know, it's sort of working my way down to, you know, what I can, basically what I can still offer. Um, and the other thing about it is, is working your way down before you come time expired. Right. You know, um, you know, I I'm very, very fortunate that I've done some kind of quite technical surgical slash obstetrics as well with the the abnormal placentas and everything else. But I'm also realizing that there there is a point where you have to recognize when when you're doing it, you're not achieving it to the same level you were. And now some people are satisfied to go down significantly. And others, and I include myself in those, is not. You know, I, I think when I recognize that things are tailing off, um, then I will find another way of doing it. And I think one thing that, that that's really lost, especially among surgeons, especially to some of the obstetricians, is they just retire and go to the golf course. God help me, go to the golf course. I mean, shoot me quickly if I went there. But, but <laughs> me too. <laughs> but yeah, I, I, it's five hours of my life. I'll never get back again, um, or maybe more. Um, but having those people, and that's what I've been trying to introduce, and I've not been very successful so far as a department. Keeping them within the fold as mentors and tutors to younger people to operate with them, because I might see a problem arising five minutes before the operator would and that's got nothing to do with the fact that i've been there probably x thousand times before where they've been there 10 times that time before so you know i think that's really important i think you know i think what happens with physicians is they get so tired and they get a date okay this is the date i my tea time is the nine o'clock the next morning but then they go home and what else are they going to do i mean and we we fill our time, but you know the per, the, the self worth of going to the hospital half a day a week, one day a week to an operating room. It's really not a big part of your time, but you still maintain your incredible self worth. The fact you're contributing, you know. So I don't know. Mm -hmm. I, I that's how I would like to end my career. I mean, people might just want to say, well, just leave. <laughs> we don't want you anymore. <laughs> just go away. I mean, you know, I've had enough of you. You've been here long enough. Which is fine, also, um, but I'd like I'd like that to be sort of my legacy, if you will. Sure. Well, and I I think that um, 
the desire and perhaps even you could call it a responsibility to pass on the mountain of yeah. knowledge that you have inside your head. Yeah, it's, it's, something, it's something that we just don't do. I, 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 yeah. When I started as the head of department and really it's only been two years and the year of it's been occupied by COVID. So all these big ideas, of course, are all written on the whiteboard here on the wall here. Uh, <laughs> and that's amongst them, you know, that, um, you know, how, how we transition people to being worthwhile, you know, making a little bit of money still, it's his pocket money to go on your travels or whatever else. And, um, and, and really um, helping younger practitioners mm -hmm. who, when they're young in practice, have all kinds of doubts about themselves and all kind we all had it we all had it Absolutely. You know, the, as you know from the statistics you're most likely to get sued in the first two years of practice yeah and as you stated earlier that it's not uncommon that that might take you out of practice you know because that's such a devastating event at such an early yeah. time in your life where you barely got your feet on the ground yeah you know? i know one person that that stopped and she was only I think you know, by the time everything got settled five or six years in, but it was such a traumatic event. And she was excellent at what she did. And she had a constitution of an ox because to be a resident, and you know, we now we're talking about equity and diversity now, in the time when we were residents, where as men, we got abused. As women, it was... You know, the, 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 it was abuse. I mean, let's be perfectly frank now. Um, the, it was even worse, you know, and, and, and us as, as co residents couldn't protect that, couldn't protect them from it. It was just, we couldn't, couldn't protect them, not we didn't want to. Uh, but she had the constitution of an ox, literally. I don't know where, I think, I think inherently she did. But it, 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 it crucified her mm -hmm. to the point where she stopped doing obstetrics. I mean, she still operates and she's a great operator. We should stop doing obstetrics, mm -hmm. um, which was, I think, of. which I think was terrible. Personally, yeah. it was terrible. That's not unheard of, I don't think. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, so, still... answer that. I mean, I that question started with how, how you, what advice you give to younger medical students? <laughs> what advice? No, it's perfect. I love yeah. the journey that yeah. that took. How, what advice would you give to your young, yourself, your younger self, if you could, knowing what you know now? Great question. I was reading that last this last night, and I was thinking how I'm going to answer that. Uh, <laughs> um, what advice would I give myself? Take a step back more often. Um, we can all work, not work as hard, but that's just a very generic answer. Um, enjoy the successes that you have, because not to give you a gold star, but to remember that the times when you don't have success is what we remember the remember the good things you did in your career in life, as opposed to we all remember the worst things because they don't happen very often, but they seem to occupy us such a larger part of our cerebrum. I think that's what I'd say to myself because I I, I have a story in my mind of, of of situations where there's been poor outcome, not very many, I but enough. And I can cite the tame name dates, absolutely of it, and uh, just take a step back and you know, and, and remember that you go to, to advise myself. Remember, you go to work to do the best every day, and sometimes the best doesn't turn out to have the best outcome. That's the right. advice I would give myself. That's really good advice. You know, don't be quite so hard on yourself. Certainly not to measure your self-worth by the worst day is good advice for everybody, mm. right? Because yeah. we've all got those days. Yeah, indeed. So what, um, what is it that people most often get wrong about you? Um, if I'm being very frank, I have, people have accused me of being arrogant. I'm not mm. arrogant. I mean, I'm, confident there's no doubt about it and i'm confident in what i do but no arrogance um um and i think it's got something to do I, I hope it's got something more to do with my english heritage than it has necessarily to do with my own personality um but yeah that, that has been you know and it, it, i suppose you can come across that because i think 
one of my natures is I'm I'm fairly to the point about things. The, the, you know, I, I like people to understand where I stand. I, I try and say it kindly, but I will let them know exactly what I think and they think what is correct. And sometimes I think that comes across as, as, uh, as a degree of arrogance, uh, which is not meant to be. And I, I, you know, and people say, well, if you say I'm not arrogant, that really means you are because you're saying you're not. I, I, no, I'm not. I, I, I actually, it's, actually I'm probably the converse I actually I'm I, I think I'm actually the converse that uh but uh, it's funny how other people sometimes have an impression of you never have of yourself mm-hmm. um and the other people's the other thing that people yeah think about me is I talk too much but that's just something that's can't do anything <laughs> about that I would say I mean we could flip all those things around and see your confidence and your yeah. Your ability to hold a great conversation is some incredible positives. And I think, like, I don't know you well, but I've certainly bumped into you personally several times in the last... Yeah, we'll cross paths, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Our paths cross. And um, you, I, I haven't ever worked with you in a professional situation, so I don't know what that looks like. But certainly, there's something about your confidence and even just your stature and your size and your English accent, which gives you... <laughs> <laughs> which just gives uh, you authority. Well, maybe I my English accent. Actually, when I came to Canada, I talked like they do in Coronation Street. That's how <laughs> I used to speak. And now my accent has been watered down a little bit. So it's still English, very much so. But I'll go back to England now, where I'm from, and I'll say, "God, you've got an American accent." Oh, wow. I said, I said, talk to my patients. I don't think they'll agree with you on that. Um, so, yeah, but my, because I came from that kind of neighborhood, you know, and um, so you know, the accents, it's helpful. I mean, oh, it is helpful. It comes across for whatever reason. Yeah, you it is. And it's, it's, have it. it's, it's <laughs> something about it. I mean, I don't have the BBC accent, which I think is the, is the full house, you know, the BBC how now brown cow i'm talking from the bbc <laughs> news um i don't have that um but i worked yeah, in but- london i worked in london i worked in australia for a bit i've mm-hmm. worked all over the place so you put a big pick a bit of accents up it was really interesting when i first came to canada i actually had to be a family doctor for six months before you could go and do anything else and i worked in the bays of newfoundland and i actually had to have can you imagine a bays of newfoundland with an accent like mine and a newfoundland oh. accent and um <laughs> The, the the secretary there, who happened to be from more central Canada, had to come in and translate the consultation with the patients because I had no clue what they were saying and they had no <laughs> clue what I was saying. So the, each visit, even if it was for replenishment of hypertension medication, was at least half an hour and generally it was an hour. Oh my goodness! <laughs> and so and so it, it was it was it, yeah it was fascinating. I, I that was six six months of my life, which was the most probably one of those rewarding in medicine. I did absolutely everything. I mean, I can tell you stories about that place that would go on for hours and hours. Mm, you know, things you just did that because you're in the middle of nowhere, cut off for oftentimes for days on end from anywhere else and so you were it doesn't matter what it was you were it medically you were doing all kinds of odd things i i remember doing a burr hole with a black and decker drill in the middle of the night <laughs> because the patient couldn't go anywhere in the middle of a snowstorm and, the, and and thankfully i missed the division of the the facial artery and actually blood came spurting out of his cranium and he woke up Oh my goodness. For anyone who doesn't know what a burr hole is, it's basically drilling a hole in your skull to relieve pre- pressure from bleeding of the brain. And yeah, there was a Black & Decker drill that I hadn't, I hasten to add, wasn't sterilized. It just came from, the, we had a cottage hospital. We had a, <laughs> um, we had a, um, uh, like a, um, you know, the people who work in the general caretaker people. And uh, yeah, and it, you know, and it wasn't, wasn't very elegant and it looked horrible, but it did the trick. I mean, and uh, yeah, I, oh, there's all kinds of, I mean, I had some oh, incredible stories that, you know, people, and people look at you and say, oh, no, that never happened. Well, oh, I've got nothing to substantiate without finding the person it actually happened to. Uh, but, you know, I look back and I think, my God, did I actually do that? I mean, mm-hmm. I, I, mean but I hasten to add, I was shaking and I had, because there was no, no Zoom then, it was all by telephone with a neurosurgeon at St. John's Newfoundland. And he said, oh, yeah, just go here, 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 and drill. I said, oh, okay. 
and the guy <laughs> guy had fallen off a snow machine. They, no one wore helmets. Came off a snow machine, banged his head. Oh had localizing symptoms on one side, so it was pretty obvious where it was likely to be. So we just sort of drilled a hole and hoped. Or he was or he died, you know. I mean literally oh, no. he's not gonna to get to the hospital because we were we were cut off in the middle of nowhere for in a massive snowstorm. So I mean he's either died or you or you you put a hole in his cranium basically. I'm sure he tells I'm sure he, tell, he I'm sure he tells the story better than I do. Yeah, I'd love to hear his side of the story. Yeah, I don't know. I still think about being young anyway. and unformed and optimistic and just going for it. I had an experience working in the Yukon for four years, and I'm I would sure. say that was some of the funnest years of my life. Oh. Medevac flights to small little towns, you know, Dawson yeah. City and Mayo and Barrow and Watson Lake, and um, yeah, you just did things that you will never, ever, ever do again. And it was it was medicine. It was real medicine, you know. I mean, yeah. uh, you know, I mean, a lot of medicine now. Uh, we are. Uh, just, um, it can be playing towards people's first world anxieties. God, I could get shot down for saying that, couldn't I? But <laughs> it is, you know, and 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 um, you know, and I say that when I I I, I haven't been abroad, overseas to on missions for quite some time now for various different reasons i mean you go there i mean people say well doesn't it make you feel like you know how good it's got what you've got and how lucky you are i said if you don't think you don't know that already then that's actually quite sad <laughs> mm -hmm. you know and i go there and, and i get out of going going there is what i get out of going there is how fantastic the people are who do the medicine out there compared to me literally mm -hmm. literally mm -hmm. you know and um you know i remember in papua new guinea and there you did all the cancer work and i mean really cancer work not not just a bit of cancer work. i mean like significant because no they couldn't go anywhere nowhere else they could go so you, you did all the operating and, you know and uh you know and the, these guys were working there it was like to them, it was you just just do it. To me, it was thinking, oh my god, I got to remember how to do a radical hysterectomy and do all this sort of stuff, and they're like you know, and because I sort of don't do it because we have oncologists. Mm. So it's I I mean I, that's the other thing I'd like to do. I'd like to get go back and do that again. And uh, I like to do when I go the missions, I go for more than two weeks because I I don't I don't want to be one of these physician tourists. I want to actually you know the two things you should do is one be there long enough to understand the problems they have and two be there long enough to be able to help them change what they do to deal with the problems that they have and two weeks doesn't cut it two weeks is just is literally just like i'm so much involved now with birth tourism in alberta and like that is physician tourism in africa or southeast asia or wherever happens you happen to go so right. i you know that's another thing that i need to find three months somewhere to go and find a place that wants me for three months i'm sure that won't be hard and i'm sure mm. that's coming up in your future we'll, we'll a, see we'll see <laughs> what an interesting and fascinating way to mm. um you know to kind of move and to share your knowledge not just locally to pass down your knowledge to the students and residents and interns that you teach yeah. but around the world I think it is. So, i'm just going to ask you one last question yeah that's of course interesting one because i know you've got a busy day ahead as we mentioned i have what is your superpower? <laughs> um, I don't have one. I'm just like everybody else. I've just been very fortunate in my life. Literally, uh, I've been very fortunate in my life to do something that I actually love doing. And I still love doing it. And I've been in practice for 31 years this year. That's the only superpower. I'm very fortunate to do something that I can get out of bed in the morning and look forward to doing every day. Oh, that is actually a great superpower, I'd say. The mm. love of life, the love of your career. Very fortunate. Very, yeah. very fortunate. That's good. Well, listen, I just want to um, thank you once again for the time that you've taken to talk to us, for the knowledge that you've shared, for the interesting stories that you've told. And... Um, Maybe a year from now, we'll come back and talk about this again, because I'm fascinated of the subject of COVID and how it affects pregnancy. And I'm very interested in some of those stats that you brought up. Happy, uh, whenever. I, and, I, and thank you very much for asking me to do this. It's actually, I'm actually quite flattered that you actually asked me to do it, actually. <laughs> well, I'm flattered that you agreed. And it's been a great conversation. <laughs> you too. So, 
Moscow. Thank you so much. And take, take care. care.